All right, today on the Writing Coach Podcast, I have Michael E. Ginsberg. Michael, it's so good to see you. Welcome to the show. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. I was thinking about it. Obviously, you're a former client of mine, and you worked really, really hard on your book. Most of my clients do. And so generally, even though I spend hours and hours talking to clients like you, we mostly are talking about the work, right? And so I'm yes. actually looking forward to this opportunity to kind of chat with you about your life a bit, because really all of our discussions have been focused on the manuscript. And so it's exciting for this opportunity to get to know you personally a bit better. That was great. I, I'm happy to chat. I'm excited to, to connect again and very excited about all the, the good work we did together. So happy to chat. Well, I know, obviously, you're a baseball fan, but now anyone, if they're watching the video of this, can see <laughs> you're a huge baseball fan. Let's go back to childhood. Uh, were you mostly into sports as a kid, or was writing and books part of your life as a child? Um, had a lot of different interests as a kid. I, you know, I sports were definitely an interest. Played little league baseball, uh, played tennis, I ran cross country. Um, I was also very interested in space flight, so I... I spent a lot of time um, studying. Uh, I, I did a lot of science classes. I went to space camp, U.S. space camp, uh, a couple of times, um, and, and did a lot of those things. In fact, I, I studied engineering as a as an undergrad, so um, certainly that was an interest as well. Uh, but um, yeah, those were sort of probably my biggest couple of interests growing up. What about books? Were there novels or as a kid oh. books that really interested you? Yeah, no, definitely, definitely there were. I, you know, I'm a huge history buff and I love reading history. I love reading biographies. Um, and especially, you know, I really enjoy, um, you know, political history and military history from the 20th century. So I read a lot of that, um, both U.S. history and international history, um, world history, uh, so I, you know, I, I, and, and some of that probably influenced the writing because, you know, so many of the things I, I read and I wrote or that I wrote about, you know, were things that I picked up or saw as I read. Um, in terms of fiction, I think I really enjoy things like Tom Clancy, you know, so you can imagine um, the, the sort of the techno thriller that have a lot of, you know, real elements to them. I mean, a lot of it is based in reality, but uh, spun up to be sort of an exciting and dramatic book. Well, I haven't even mentioned Debt Bomb yet. <laughs> Michael Ginsburg's new book, Debt Bomb, came out three days ago. And I think pretty clearly those Tom Clancy-esque influences are there in the book. Yeah, no, they definitely are. They definitely are. You know, between my the reading Tom Clancy and, and similar books, you know, there are a lot of folks that write similar books like uh, like like that that vein. Um, and also my, my personal, you know, now I, I work as an attorney. Um, but I spent several years in um, the U.S. Uh, Office of Director of National Intelligence. So, you know, a lot of the things I saw and I learned um, influenced my writing. So it all kind of hangs together when you when you step back from it. So someone who's worked in real life national security, how big is the gap between the things we see in fiction and what's really going on in the real world? Um, I, I mean, I think there's there's some gap, uh, but, you know, there there's a lot of you know, realism, particularly writers like Tom Clancy, bring a lot of realism to their work. Uh, and so you can sort of see uh, the influences that, that he clearly had. Um, so you can tell that uh, it's grounded in reality. Certainly there's exaggerations and um, obviously things are sped up. You know, one of the things that you realize when you're in the, the government is things don't move quickly, you know, in two hour movie blocks. Um, so, you know, it, 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 it doesn't move quite at that pace, but there are, there are a lot of, uh, there's certainly, it, uh, is fair to say it, it, it reflects, uh, reality. I knew you were a Harvard grad and I knew you were an attorney, but looking at your bio, I found out you also have a different masters from Stanford mm -hmm. in an area that I didn't even know what it was. So tell me about <laughs> this Stanford master's degree. Sure. So it's called aeronautics and astronautics. It's essentially aerospace engineering. Um, so it's, it's more or less engineering for spacecraft, aircraft, uh, satellites, those types of things. 
Uh, and that, that's kind of what I did when I was out there. I focused primarily on uh, composite structures. So things uh, made out of composites, airframes, fuel tanks, things like that, that are made from composite materials that obviously because they're lightweight, uh, they have a lot of advantages uh, over, you know, uh, uh, classic metals, you know, aluminum, things like that. Uh, so there's there, that that's kind of what, what I studied for a couple of years there at Stanford. This is the first time we've got into a discussion about lightweight aluminums in my podcast ever, Mike. <laughs> first time for everything. <laughs> there doesn't seem to be, at least on the surface, to be a lot of crossover between law and aerospace engineering. How do those things come together for you? Or do you just have diverse interests? Well, it's probably a lot of the latter. I certainly have you know diverse interests. There, Surprisingly, there are... Um, areas where they, they overlap. You know, I was always interested in politics in addition to space flight. And of course, uh, space flight, like everything else that's funded by the government, uh, is, you know, has politics and political aspects to it. Uh, decisions are made for, you know, influenced by politics. Uh, and of course, you know, here in the United States, um, you know, the NASA administrator is a political appointee, is appointed by the president. So, um, you know, that, that there is certainly like everything else the government does, there is a political element to it. And that always interested me. Uh, and when I was at Stanford, you know, I took a number of classes in the operations research department uh, on the topic of uh, the intersection between science and national security. Uh, and so you would talk about things like atomic, you know, nuclear policy, uh, whether it's developing nuclear weapons, safeguarding nuclear weapons, disposing of nuclear weapons, all those sorts of things. What, how should we, what, what should the doctrine of use be? All those sorts of things. And of course, um, missiles, space, all of that. Uh, understanding the technology helps understand uh, the, not only what we do and our capabilities, but what, you know, others, you know, the adversaries are thinking about what they're contemplating doing. So you can understand, okay, they're doing this, I know what that means. Uh, so it, 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 there's surprisingly overlap, but it's, it's, it's not obvious. I mean, it's, you got to dig a little bit to see where it's at. Well, what about the Harvard and the creative writing overlap? Because there's a long tradition mm -hmm. from National Lampoon to, I know yep. a lot of the writers on The Simpsons yep. come out of Harvard. Uh, Absolutely. In, in your time at Harvard, did you rub shoulders at all with the writing community there? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I spent four years as a sports writer for the newspaper. Um, so I was I was actually an editor of the Harvard Crimson, which was the, is the daily paper. Um, I'm not sure they actually do print editions anymore. It may just be online. But certainly when I was there, we had print runs and we had, a you know, this giant press in the basement. And, you know, we inked it up and, you know, out, you know, the thing spooled out. But so I was an editor of the paper. So I did the layout. I did I covered hockey. I covered uh uh, lacrosse and I covered soccer. Uh, so I, I spent a lot of time traveling with the team and writing about the team and interviewing players and coaches and things like that. And of course, when I was at the Crimson, uh, I um, worked with a lot of folks on the news side, you know, I got to know them. So yeah, no, there, there's definitely overlap. Um, you know, a few people I can think of. I know, uh, for example, Sewell Chan, um, he used to work at the New York Times. He's now the op-ed uh, editor for the Los Angeles Times. Um, and I know a few people that went on to like the Washington Post and things like that, for sure. So was it your love of sports that drew you into journalism or did you just want to be a journalist and you happen <laughs> to like sports? That, that's, you know, it's an interesting question. Like so many things I think in, in life, you know, I almost I almost fell into it almost by accident. I always loved sports. I mean, there's no question about that and really uh, did enjoy that. Certainly never thought of it as a career, but uh, enjoyed it. But I, I went to the open house, you know, the first week of uh, college and I went there and I was like, oh, this sounds good. And they immediately gave me a, a sport to cover. They sent me to a water polo game and I covered the water polo game. And I really enjoyed it. So I covered another game. And then, you know, one thing led to another. And, you know, there I was pretty much enmeshed in it. And I, I really enjoyed it. Were you doing any fiction writing at that time or were you primarily focused on nonfiction? I was primarily focused on nonfiction. I did have a column, you know, a sports column. So I, I was sort of an opinion piece. So in that sense, it wasn't uh, writing just fact, but sort of here's what I'm thinking or, you know, trying to be funny, you know, you know, try to. So so there's certainly a creative aspect to that. And of course, we all you know, the first year at Harvard, you have to take uh, what they call expository writing. So you have to, you know, do that as well. So I did that. Um, 
and and throughout Harvard, you know, you have core curriculum requirements. So I took a poetry class. I I took several history classes, but um, I didn't have as much creative writing opportunity as as maybe I, I would have liked at the time. Uh, you know, spending so much time in the engineering lab, you know, didn't give me a lot of time to, you know, most of what I was writing had numbers and Greek letters and all that stuff. So at what point did the idea of being a novelist start percolating in the back of your mind? So, you know, I'd always, you know, I love writing as you become an attorney. And I, I really, one of the things I, I struggled with as an attorney was was making my writing good. So I really worked at it. I spent a lot of time working at it, worked for judges who were good writers expressly with the purpose of trying to become a better writer. Uh, and I, I really developed it you know, through my time in, in practice and clerking for judges and things like that. Uh, but what really spurred it was the fact that I, I was really, I, the, the issue that I cover in debt bomb, the national debt, the U.S. national debt, um, it really scared me, I, you know, it just, it, and I thought, you know, I kept thinking to myself, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if the other thing happens? And the more I thought about it, I thought, well, you know, it's, it's sort of marinating in my mind, but these are actually kind of interesting thoughts. Maybe there's a story there. And so I, I married my interest in writing with this story that was in my head and uh, got to work. Well, this might be why you and I connected. I think there's a lot of writers out there. I read all these writing instructional books about the beautiful transformative nature of writing and how you can release your soul or, or you know, process trauma. And like, for me, I'm just like, writing is an outlet for rage and fear <laughs> and anger. And it's like, I, I, think, I think that's maybe why we connected. It's this idea of you wanted to tell a great, thriller story, but you wanted to do it. You were coming from a genuine place of concern and fear about something happening in the real world. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. I, you know, I joke, you know, some people monetize really, um, you know, wild ideas on the internet. And I, I said, well, I'm going to monetize my fear. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, but, but, you know, all kidding aside, I thought, you know, this is an opportunity to, to both. Uh, I, I, it's an issue that really does worry me. And it's an issue I think that doesn't get the attention it does because it's not an obvious crisis. It's sort of a, a slow moving thing. You know, you, there's that old Hemingway line from uh, Sun Also Rises, you know, how did you go bankrupt? You know, first gradually and then suddenly. And so I think, well, we're in the gradually phase of it all. And I'm, I'm scared to death of the suddenly phase. And so uh, I thought, well, here's an opportunity both to entertain, but also um, you know, get that, that point, of, make people think about it, just kind of get that kind of kernel in people's mind. And, you know, there's something to think about here. There's something real underlying this. This is one of the things that's really interesting for me, working with a lot of different writers from all around the world. Often they have expertise in different areas or different passions that I don't know that much about or that um, I don't relate to necessarily. And so I often kind of focus on story and craft and and those aspects of of helping the writer and then they bring in their passion and expertise on different areas but i was reading since the book came out two days ago i was rereading it and well reading it for the first time as a published book and something that occurred to me was i think you were really smart with the opening scene in that the idea of national debt, especially for someone like me, a Canadian, I don't know much about America. I don't know enough about my own country's <laughs> economic situation, let alone America's. Um, but something you do in the opening scene of the book is you personalize it. You say, here's the big national issue, but here it is on a one person level. And I think that's a great way to bring the reader into the book, especially someone like myself who might not know much about fiscal policy or even debt management or just my own financial um, handling. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's true. I mean, I, I think that there, there are a lot of similarities. I mean, obviously there, there are certainly differences between a national government and, a, and a, um, you know, an individual's personal finances, but uh, at some level, you know, at the deepest, the most fundamental level, they're they're similar. I mean, yeah, yeah there's that. Uh, I love going back to old people's qu older quotes from the past. And there's the the economist Herbert Stein. He says things that can't go on forever will stop. And it, in in at the and and the, what you're 
you're alluding to, and I think you're exactly right about this. And I, that's why I think that I, I, I appreciate that that's first scene works um, is because um, the time frame for which it stops is different for an individual than for a country, but it's still ultimately the same underlying principle. And I, yeah, I appreciate that, that you think that works because that, that was certainly what I was going for. <laughs> Well, let's tell the listeners or viewers a bit about the book itself. Tell us about sure. Debt Bomb. Sure, sure. So Debt Bomb is, um, it asks the question, what would happen if uh, the United States entered a, a real honest-to-goodness debt crisis? And that debt crisis was engineered by an American adversary, in this case, the People's Republic of China. Uh, what would happen? What would be the consequences? And how do we get ourselves out of it? So the story uh, revolves around a plot to do just that by the Chinese to engineer an American debt crisis. And a debt crisis means that uh, America can't pay its debt, it can't borrow, and it's stuck in this position of either defaulting, which is a, you know, a terrible situation and probably would bring down the entire economy, or making dramatic cuts to its economy or, or what have you, um, somehow coping with the situation. And that that's really the story is on the one hand, you have the Chinese trying to engineer this debt crisis in an effort uh, to defeat the United States and become the global hegemon. Uh, and you have, on the other side, the suburban accountant who, like me, you know, is just worried about the debt but can't get anybody to listen to her, but somehow breaks through and gets one person to listen to her. And that person brings her onto his presidential campaign, and he ultimately wins, and she becomes... Uh, the budget director for the country, and the the two you know paths collide when the Chinese debt crisis uh, runs into uh, our heroines' efforts to stop the debt problem, and they and the, all the issues and the whole story flow from there. And it's got you know spies embedded here and there, and there are people lurking in the shadows, uh, and of course um, you have the Chinese uh, government. Uh, doing its thing. So it's it's a really, uh, it covers a lot of ground and a lot of different issues, but that that's sort of the nub of the story. Yeah, and I think the interesting thing is what you kind of touched on at the end there. Uh, this is a very real topic, something you've said is very passionate to you and terrifying to you, a real concern in the real world that you're, you're kind of an activist for in the real world. Yeah. But then you take that real world concern and it's really wrapped in a fun, adventure with spies and espionage and i mean i think we talked about james bond we talked yep. about tom clancy i mean it's a great thriller exciting fun story it just happens to have its beating heart a message that means a lot to you exactly exactly and i think you know it's advice you know you gave and others have given you know write the things that you know you know write about what you know and um being able to take something that you know, it makes it a lot easier to spin the story because you you have a feel for the underlying issues. Uh, but also, you know, like you say, you know, bringing in that entertaining aspect of it, I thought it was important because I, I didn't want this book to be read widely. You know, I didn't want this to be like a white paper. You know, I wanted it to be, um, I joke with people, I said sort of one part of white paper, one part Manchurian candidate, and one part HBO's Beyond Scared Straight, if you've seen it. Um, you know, it's, it's trying to combine all of that into a, an interesting story. One of the things that I find so amazing about your work on this book, I mean, I've worked with a few lawyers now, and they are some of the smartest, hardest working people I've ever worked with. And for you, you were writing this, you're a lawyer, for one, lawyers are busy people, mm -hmm. you have a young family, and then the pandemic happened. Mm -hmm. And yeah you know, these were some of the most challenging times of my life, part of the most challenging times of many people's lives. How did you remain focused and make such great progress on this manuscript while the world was being turned upside down? That's a great question. And I, I know it has been hard for, for a lot of folks, certainly hard. I mean, it was hard on me. It was harder on the kids. I mean, it's really challenging for kids to be stuck at home and, and, and so forth. Uh, you know, it just, it was a challenging time. In some ways, you know, I found it kind of therapeutic to be able to kind of just close the door, go into the basement and write. Um, 
it, it, so in a way, it was one of the things that got me through, <laughs> you know, focusing on it in that way. Uh, and I kind of stayed with the, the process that I had been using before the pandemic hit, which was getting up very early and spending two or three hours before the workday writing, uh, staying up a little later and, you know, a couple hours before going to bed writing. And then, of course, you know, during the course of the day, if I had something that popped into my head, uh, I was working from home, I just, you know, dive in and try to do it. Um, but to be honest with you, it was nice to have, mm. uh, especially at a time where you really couldn't do much outside other than, you know, take a walk or something like that. It was, it was good to have something to put your mind on that wasn't, um, you know, scary and, and distressing. I can see also how it, it, the whole experience almost justifies the premise of your novel in that people said the whole world can never turn upside down. And then it did. You know, right. you're telling a story where you're saying to everyone, everything you know could change. Right. I don't know. Prior to the pandemic, that would have seemed pretty far out there. Now we've seen the whole world. We've seen every aspect of our lives change overnight, uh, which perhaps I could see in inspiring when writing a story about the world turning upside down. Exactly. No, that's absolutely right. That's absolutely right. And and one of the the theses of you know folks like me who worry about the debt is that uh, in good times you ought to not be building up debt because you never know when you are going to need to spend huge amounts of money because some crisis you didn't predict comes along and demands it. And that's exactly what the pandemic was. I mean, the United States has probably spent, you know, at least three or four trillion dollars in various kinds of stimulus, economic assistance, all these sorts of things. And crises are when you should spend like that and go into debt if you have to and all that. But we have much less flexibility because we started from such a high debt point and that's only gotten worse. So when the next who knows what crisis we can't predict, as you say, the pandemic is one of these things that nobody I mean, I guess some people sort of thought, well, that could happen, but nobody was planning for that possibility. And it's just such an astronomical sum of money. Um, you know, you hate to think about, it, but if there's another world war, are you going to be able to fight it? Um, all those sorts of things, you just, uh, the pandemic sort of put that into relief. Absolutely. Going back to writing for a moment. Yeah. What brought you to me? At what point did you say, did you, did you know writing coaches were out there? Um, how did we end up working together? Sure. No, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I talked to uh, a variety of people out in the, the world and you know, they're, they're folks you can look at on the internet and things like that. Um, you know, I looked at, for example, Jane Friedman, you know, who's, who's very well known in the space about publishing and writing. And I had an opportunity to, to talk to her a little bit and work, work a little bit with her and, um, you know, drafting some of the, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, query letters and things like that. And in the course of that, you know, I asked her about, you know, what do you think of a writing coach? And, and she thought it was a great idea. So I began researching writing coaches. Um, and I was looking for uh, somebody who I thought, you know, would understand and, and would be sort of, you know, on my wavelength, I guess you could say. And so I, I went to the, you know, people there are all kinds of names out there but I, I i liked your website and i i said i'm going to reach out and i talked to other folks and uh, you know i just i i felt like in talking with you it, it really just felt like i i was on the same wavelength and you kind of got where what i was trying to do and where i was going and um you know i i said this is this is good I, i'd like to proceed for someone who hasn't worked with a writing coach how would you describe the experience what did you get out of it I, I found it tremendously valuable. I mean, tremendously valuable. In addition to obviously taking a book from, a, you know, one place to another place from, you know, a, a good story that had, you know, a lot of potential to a really polished work that not only was polished, but had sort of professionalized, I guess you could say. I'm not a professional writer. Um, so now, adding right? those professional elements like, of... You just published a novel. You are a professional writer. I mean, <laughs> amazing, my friend. But but I didn't start there. And that and that, you know, I mean, you got me there. And and working with you, I, I now I, I now understand, you know, the the, the way of a structure of a story, you know, how to structure things and character development and all these things that, you know, you might learn if you were a, you know, a, a creative writing scholar in college or in graduate school, but 
you know, if you didn't go through that, you know, you, you wouldn't have had that. And so you need that. I, I think I needed that. Um, and that's why I say, I think it took the story from a, a good raw material. There's a good story there to polishing it to a place where, um, you know, I'm comfortable sending it out into the world. Uh, and that, that made all the difference. And, and the process, you know, just the learning how to edit and how to go through things, and how to look at things. I mean, all of these, just at my vantage point changed. Just um, like you say, you know, I'm a professional now, but I wasn't at the beginning. Well, none of us get there on our own. This is the right. big myth of, of publishing, unfortunately. They throw one author's name on the front, and then everyone just thinks, you know, a person sits down, types it all up first try, hits print, and sends it out to the to the bookstores, right? Which is obviously right. not the case. A lot of people are involved in the creation of a book. So tell me about the process of working with your publisher then. Sure, sure. So I worked with a hybrid publisher, a company called BQB, and I found that to be a really good option for someone like me who had, you know, gone through a, a pretty rigorous process of editing and developing, um, but, uh, you know, not just sort of self-publishing. I, I like, you know, I, I was really going back and forth between self-publishing, traditional publishing and hybrid publishing. And the, the reason I liked the hybrid option was because it, it had one more layer of, of editing, review, and, and, you know, line editing, things like that. Um, they also had some ideas, creative ideas about marketing and connections to marketing uh, efforts. So they, they understood that world in a way that I didn't, you know, that I, I think I understand a lot better now. Uh, but they helped me understand I and mean, they helped me learn that aspect of things as well. So uh, that was a valuable process. It probably added six months uh, to things. But um, in the end, I think those six months were were well worth it. Uh, and I don't think it hurt the. you know, in the end, I think it's probably better where the time it came out. Originally, I'd hoped it would come out before the election. But I think it probably would have gotten lost in the noise of the election. Mm. And I think now particularly where here in America, we are still talking about trillion dollar spending bills. That has come into refocus as a real issue. Uh, and, um, and so that timing worked out. So I, I think that the, the hybrid model is very good. It, it can be, it's not tremendously expensive. That's the other thing that I, I liked about it. It can be expensive. Some are expensive, some are less expensive. Um, and I went sort of with the less expensive option uh, but I thought they did a really good job. In fact, I think uh, some of those more expensive options actually do less work. Uh, so, you know, I think, I guess for folks listening, you do need to look at these different folks carefully. Shockingly, the guy who wrote the book about debt did not go with the most expensive option. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike, the book has been out for three days now. How does it feel to have the book out in the world and to be an author? It, it, it definitely put a pep in my step. I mean, it really feels like, wow, you know, I, I actually did it. You know, I, I mean, I did it. That kind of reaction. Um and, you know, people are starting to read it and I'm starting to get feedback. And it's really cool to hear, you know, people, uh, number one, reading it and number two, saying, you know, this is good. This got, you know, I had somebody say, you know, I was delayed in the airport and I read it the whole, the whole way. And this was great, you know. Um, so it's 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 it, it feels like it feels like the end of a long journey. And it, it has also, um, you know, kind of set, wet my appetite to do another one. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, I want to ask you about that, what you've got up next. But going yeah. back to sticking with Debt Bomb for a little bit more, yeah, sure. what's the plan here in terms of promotion or marketing? Are you going to be doing more podcasts or what's your plan to kind of get word out there about the book? Sure, sure. No, I'm definitely um, trying to do more podcasts. Um, I have marketed it um, in the think tank world, in the political world here in the United States. So um, I have friends in the PR world because uh, I, I do political stuff on the side. So I have friends in that world who I who are helping me kind of, you know, get it into the, the bloodstream. Uh, I'm also doing a, uh, a virtual, I guess, unfortunately, it's virtual um, book tour uh, with uh, with a bunch of blogs. So it's going to be featured on a whole bunch of blogs over the course of July. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. Um, and then, you know, word of mouth, LinkedIn, you know, it's funny, LinkedIn is a remarkably good source. Like I get, 
I get more comments from LinkedIn than Facebook, to be perfectly honest. Um, I get a lot of, uh, maybe because LinkedIn has more of uh, the audience, you know, that, that I'm going for. Uh, it just maybe there's more on LinkedIn, but they, they definitely, I've gotten a lot of reactions and, you know, we'll see how, how people feel after they read the book. Um, but, uh, and of course, you know, word of mouth is, is huge. Absolutely. All right. So looking to the future. Yeah. You're going to do another book. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I've already started thinking about it. Um, and, you know, one of the, the kind of the genre I'm sort of thinking about, and then maybe this gets to another sort of personal um, issue of mine is that I, I love history and I'm not sure that our American school system is doing the best job of teaching history that it could. Um, not that it's bad. I mean, I, I think I got, you know, a good history education, but there were a lot of things that the history didn't cover. Um, it just didn't make it in. And, and part of that is just, you know, you only have so much time and you got to hit the basics. And so one of the things I, I've been thinking about doing is a genre where you, you take sort of historical events and historical uh, happenings and fictionalize them, you know, unusual historical events um, that people may not know about, but are really interesting and turn them into fiction. Um, because I think that there is a, and in that way, you know, you do two things. Number one, you write a great story, um, but you also kind of shine light on these, these important, but perhaps obscure uh, historical happenings. And so I have a couple in my mind that I think are going to form the basis of my next work. Well, knowing your work ethic and your intelligence and passion, I'm sure whatever project you move forward with is going to be great. I'm excited. I thank you. I appreciate that. I wanted to ask you sure. when your publisher sent you the proof of your book for the first time and you held that paperback copy in your hands. Can you tell me about that experience? Oh, yeah. No, it's so cool. I mean, you, you're looking at it. And you're like, wow, this came out. You know, this, the cover looks great. And, you know, it's got quotes on the back. And it's a real I, I did it. You know, you're, you're holding it like this thing. Um, you know, it's like a, you, your newborn child. I don't want to drop it. You know, oh, my God. Uh, <laughs> but and then you look through it and and then, um, you know, you're like, please don't see an error. Please don't see a mistake. Please don't see a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but but then you, you get through it and you're like, it looks, I mean, this is a real thing. It's a real book. You know, it's not, um, you know, it's not just a pamphlet. It's not just something I printed out. Uh, it's, it's real. I mean, there's a, it just hits you that, gosh, this is, even when they sent me the, the advanced review copy that was in PDF, you know, I was like, wow, this looks like a real book. Well, it's, it's a great feeling. I'm so proud of you, Mike. I, I loved working with you on this project. And, you know, I work with a lot of writers. Some of them reach the finish line and some of them don't. And so w when I do get that email saying the book's coming out on such a such date, I, it's um, it's a really it's a really amazing feeling for me. It's part of what makes my job so rewarding so rewarding um whatever whatever heartache you and i went through and obviously it's always the clients who go through the, the put in the most work and go through the most challenges but um i'm there with you and when we reach that finish line and, and it becomes that real thing out in the world i i couldn't be happier for you so congratulations mike well thank you no, i appreciate it. and i you know i like i said before you know i could not have done it without your help i think it um you know we took a a good idea that had a lot of potential and we made it into a really polished book. And I, you know, I can't recommend working with a writing coach and working with you. I mean, the experience was great. Um, and like I say, I just, I learned so much that I, you know, I feel like I can use, I'm sure I can learn more, but um, I, I just, you know, where I was at the beginning and where I was at the end, I mean, it just, it, it's, it's so palpably, I made such palpable progress as a writer. It, it's, it's really gratifying to have gone through that process with you and, and to have all your help on that. Well, Debt Bomb is out now. Where should we send people to pick it up or to learn more? You can, can get it on Amazon. Um, you can get it at Barnes & Noble. Um, you can get it on um, the publisher, BQB Publishing. IPG has it. If you go to IPG, you can get it there. Um, if you go to uh, my website, uh, michaeleginsberg.com, and that's B-E-R-G, G-I-N-S-B-E-R-G. Um, you go to that website or you can just Google Michael Ginsburg debt bomb. You should be able to find that page. You'll have links to every one of those um, 
every one of those different places where you can get the book and you can learn a little bit more about me and the book and all the, so there's a trailer video, which is kind of cool. Um, you know, it's funny. We had to, we had to edit it to Amazon because we had one scene in there. There was a tank rolling and then there was a ship rolling and it was too violent for them. So they, we had to, we had to revive, take that out and do a few things. I mean, it wasn't even shooting. It was just a, you know, a warship in the sea kind of, but Amazon, but anyway, um, it was fun and, uh, yeah, they have been helpful, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's where to go. Mike, thank you so much for, be for being a guest on the show today. Oh, sure. Thank you for having me. And thank you again for all your help. It was a delight working with you.